Gene, meme, scene. These are the singular one-word themes used by Hideo Kojima to describe the first three games in his Metal Gear Solid series. Within these three words lie humanity's greatest barriers to freedom. Freedom from our genetic programming. Freedom from misinformation. Freedom from grand lies perpetuated by our supposed sociopolitical superiors. It is those who transcend these and various other forms of control that we collectively idolize. Their success inspires billions of people in the present and in the coming generations. They remind us that it is possible to not be a prisoner of fate, that we can transcend our current circumstances and pave the path forward so that others may follow. Though there are numerous examples of these types of people in reality and in fiction, their numbers pale in comparison to those who choose to live a middling, mediocre life. To those who will accept a life dictated to them by businesses and bureaucrats. This is because it is comfortable. They will sacrifice their freedom, their individuality, if it means freedom from pain. And no wonder. They have seen what happens to those who are authentic. It is those who suffer for their virtue that suffer the most. The pain of transcending the genes that programmed us, the memes that mislead us, and the scenes that comfort us, this pain is something that we have been dealing with for thousands of years. Though these three factors make it near impossible to become a truly authentic, virtuous individual, there have been strategies, philosophies, developed over thousands of years which guide humanity towards that ultimate goal. But just over the horizon, a new form of control approaches, one that we have absolutely no knowledge of. If we allow this new form of control to take hold, the very notion of individuality may become eternally null and void. In other words, we risk becoming a permanent member of the mediocre masses. Viktor Frankl, a survivor of the Nazi concentration camps, once said that everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. But what if the mental mechanisms that allow us to make those choices, our senses, become corrupted by an exterior power? Sense is the central one-word theme for Metal Gear Solid 4. This game proposes a scenario where humanity's senses will soon be collectively controlled. Their emotions, their thoughts, their will, all shall be regulated by the injection of nanomachines into their bodies. These nanomachines will be connected to a digital network created by an organization known as the Patriots, a collection of AIs that were introduced back in Metal Gear Solid 2. If this network becomes activated, the consciousness of every human being on the planet will be subject to the will of artificial intelligence. If that sounds scary, consider the fact that, according to some people in the nanotech industry, nanobots could be flowing through our bodies roughly nine years from now. Though they may help prevent us from getting sick, they may also transmit our thoughts to a wireless cloud. If this is inevitable, we need to have serious discussions about who will control that wireless cloud over the next decade. Otherwise, our reality may see its reflection in Metal Gear Solid 4. The year is 2014. Five years have passed since the Big Shell incident in New York, since the Patriot AIs secured their grip on the internet. In the years leading up to the events of Metal Gear Solid 4, the Patriots would expand their global control. Though they were a powerful totalitarian force, their control of memes in the digital realm did not help them fully accomplish their goals. To compensate, they would have to move from control of information to control of bodies and minds. It was from this desire that the concept of the SOP system was born. SOP stands for Sons of the Patriots. It was a system of control enacted through nanomachines injected into people's bodies. 
The technology that would eventually be used in the SOP was already in use with the military a decade earlier. For instance, a soldier's ability to use a weapon would be determined by whomever controlled the nanomachines. With a simple button prompt, a soldier would be physically incapable of pulling the trigger. With this technology, the Patriots saw an opportunity. The control of information via the internet would become irrelevant if they could control a human being's senses. But in order to do this, they would need an impetus for the voluntary injection of nanomachines. Luckily, they had the Big Shell incident. Following the crash of Arsenal gear into New York, along with the former president's involvement, the global community collectively rose up against America. With the amount of spending that went into the production of Arsenal gear, along with the catastrophe it produced, the nations of the world decided that America should no longer intervene in their military affairs. In order to ensure this new state of affairs, to protect them against American interventionism, these countries used the military might that was exported to them by the United States to build up their own armies. However, this was not done within the public sphere. Instead, these weapons, along with tax dollars, were given over to private military corporations, or PMCs. Within just those five years, PMC forces made up 60% of active combatants across the world. This rapid change in global military strategy was fueled by one efficient piece of technology, the SOP system. PMCs would inject their soldiers with the SOP nanomachines. On the surface, these injections made perfect sense. These nanomachines would help soldiers share their senses, allowing them to work more efficiently as a team. They would regulate a soldier's chemical balance, suppressing thoughts and emotions which might compromise a battle, and promoting chemicals that would induce a combat high. It would also, as stated previously, control a soldier's ability to pull the trigger. Soldiers would only be able to use the weapons that their side produced. Not only that, it would also prevent friendly fire, human rights abuses, and the use of nuclear weapons. While the SOP created a more ethical, efficient battlefield experience, it also brought forward an increased demand for military spending. Within those five years, the foundation of the world economy switched from that of oil to war. It was with this new war economy that the Patriots' global control began to truly metastasize. Though there were hundreds of these PMCs across the globe, there were five that were large enough to be considered global powers. Two were based in the US, one in France, the UK, and Russia. These five PMCs were under the control of a dummy corporation, one that acted as a single mother company. Its name, Outer Heaven. Its leader, Liquid Snake or Liquid Ocelot, to be more precise. At the end of Metal Gear Solid 2, Revolver Ocelot became the mental doppelganger of Liquid Snake, the primary villain of Metal Gear Solid 1. After Revolver Ocelot lost his arm in Metal Gear Solid 1, he had Liquid Snake's arm transplanted onto his. After the transplant, the nanomachines within Liquid's arm began to conflict with Ocelot's psyche, leading to a transformation in personality. On the outside, we see Ocelot, but the inside is strictly Liquid. When this happened, Liquid restarted work on his master plan, the one that was left unfinished at the end of Metal Gear Solid 1. That plan was the full realization of his father's dream, a world where soldiers would not be exploited by their governments, but instead were respected for their talents. That plan was Outer Heaven. In Metal Gear Solid 4, Liquid Ocelot has almost achieved his goal via control of the world's biggest PMCs. The only thing that stands in his way is the Patriots and their SOP system. Liquid was only able to build up his military strength by, begrudgingly, using the SOP system. Now that he has accomplished that goal, the only thing that must follow is liberation from the SOP system. When that happens, the populations of the world will fall under Liquid's control. This could not be allowed to happen. But given Liquid's power, who could possibly stop him? Only a man with an iron will. That man was Solid Snake.
At the beginning of Metal Gear Solid 4, we see Solid Snake suffering from some form of accelerated aging. Though it appears to be something like Werner Syndrome, no doctor is able to confirm a proper diagnosis. This is because Snake's aging was programmed into his DNA prior to his birth, a prognosis that was foreign to every doctor on the planet. Due to this, Snake has less than a year to live. The pain and suffering that came with the accelerated aging would make an ordinary man immobile, but it was the strength of Snake's will that kept him not only alive, but active. After all, there was one last thing he had to do before he could even contemplate the concept of death. As a personal favor to his former colonel, Roy Campbell, he travels to the Middle East to assassinate Liquid. In order to keep his mission's true objective a secret, he was given the cover job of meeting up with a threat assessment group, one named Rat Patrol 1. Following this rendezvous, Snake would briefly aid Rat Patrol in their assessment efforts, and then leave them at the right moment so he could locate Liquid Ocelot. What Snake didn't expect upon meeting up with Rat Patrol 1 was that the team leader would not only be a former ally of Snake, but a former love interest. For the first time since Metal Gear Solid 1, Meryl Silverberg makes an appearance. I did not discuss Meryl too much when I did my retrospective on Metal Gear Solid 1. Though her story did relate to that game's theme of Jean, of transcending one's heritage, she doesn't ultimately do so until this game. In both Metal Gear Solid 1 and 4, Meryl is trying to reconcile two sides of her personality. On the one hand, she grew up wanting to be a soldier in order to try and understand the father she never had. The man she thought was her father, a man named Matt Campbell, died in the Gulf War. In order to fill that void left after her father's death, in order to understand the man he was, Meryl became a formidable, committed fighter, one that even the legendary Solid Snake was impressed by. However, in trying to pursue this goal, she suppressed the side of her that was more feminine. This was brought on by numerous factors. She received extensive psychotherapy and some limited gene therapy in order to suppress her interest in men. While this arguably made her a better soldier in the short term, it was psychologically damaging for her in the long term. On top of this, her relationships with men added to this internal dilemma. Though Snake and Meryl seemed intent on living a life together at the end of Metal Gear Solid 1, this was incredibly short-lived, as Snake figured he couldn't have a normal life, one where he was forever removed from the battlefield. Though Meryl seems to have more or less moved on from this in Metal Gear Solid 4, even being complimentary to Snake in this game, we also see hints of resentment regarding this episode in her life. After all, during her formative years, she idolized Snake for his legendary efforts. The fact that the man didn't match up to the legend she grew up learning about hurt her deeply. Worst of all, however, is her relationship with Roy Campbell. At first, we are led to believe that Roy is Meryl's uncle, but if you get the non-canonical ending from the first game where Meryl dies, Roy reveals that he is actually Meryl's father, and Matt Campbell was the uncle. At some point between the end of Metal Gear Solid 1 and the beginning of Metal Gear Solid 4, Meryl learns that Roy is in fact her father. But nonetheless, she refuses to accept this fact, continuing to refer to Roy as her uncle. This is an understandable form of retaliation. After all, she spent most of her life believing that her father was dead. To find out that he actually was alive and not fulfilling his duty to her as a father would make anybody resentful. In order to cope with this reality, she refuses to utter or hear any sentence where Roy and the word father are mentioned. If you're a woman that has a heavily suppressed feminine side, an overzealously expressed masculine side, and several bad relationships with men, there will probably be one or two psychological issues that need to be dealt with. In order for Meryl to transcend these issues, she not only has to permit expression of her feminine side, but she will need to find a way to bring positive, masculine influences into her life by possibly reconciling with her father and or meeting other men that will add, not detract, from her life. We will discuss whether or not she manages to do that towards the end of this video. Meryl learns that Snake's mission isn't to join Rat Patrol in their threat assessment, 
but instead to assassinate Liquid in accordance with Roy's orders. This obviously upsets Meryl, but given the circumstances, she realizes she is in no position to stop him. A little while later, both Snake and Rat Patrol arrive at Liquid's compound. Snake spots him and is ready to pull the trigger, but before he does, something horrifying and unexplainable happens. Everybody in the area begins to lose control of their bodily and cognitive functions. Some begin to foam at the mouth, vomit or attack their comrades, while others express a variety of emotions including sadness, fear, and anger. Though Snake begins to succumb to this mysterious influence, he attempts to move closer to Liquid, all through the strength of his will. Right before Snake pulls the trigger, Liquid acknowledges him. He enthusiastically proclaims that he will soon fulfill their father's dream of outer heaven before he retreats. Right before Snake loses consciousness, a familiar face walks up to him and says the following. Snake, if you won't be a prisoner to fate, then go. Fulfill your destiny. Several hours later, Snake wakes up aboard the Nomad, a large aircraft used as a personal HQ by him, Otacon, and a little girl named Sunny Gerlukovich, the daughter of Olga Gerlukovich from Metal Gear Solid 2. Soon after Snake wakes up, Otacon informs him that he has received a video message from Naomi Hunter, a woman who served as Snake's personal support during the first game. She is also the woman who spoke to Snake right before he lost consciousness in the Middle East. She tells Snake and Otacon that she is being detained by Liquid Ocelot. This is because Naomi was responsible for the first generation nanomachines, which eventually gave rise to the ones used in the Patriot's SOP system. With her help, Liquid figures he can release his soldiers from the system and fully establish Outer Heaven. Along with her plea to Snake and Otacon for rescue, she attached an encrypted map to her message, pointing to one of Liquid's bases in South America. Seeing that this was their only lead on Liquid's location, they had no choice but to proceed. Snake trudges through several battle zones, eventually discovering Naomi's location. Before he can rescue her, he asks her about what happened in the Middle East, when all of Liquid's soldiers began to suffer psychological and physical breakdowns. Naomi proceeds to reveal the horrifying truth. As I stated before, all modern soldiers are under the control of the SOP system. The nanomachines inside their bodies enhance their combat capabilities by suppressing emotions that might inhibit their abilities, and bolstering the chemicals which produce combat highs. In the Middle East, Liquid attempted to remove his soldiers from the SOP system all at once. When that happened, all the pain, sorrow, anger, and sadness, all the emotions that the nanomachines suppressed came back, overwhelming their senses. It became too much for their bodies and minds to bear. Originally, Liquid wanted to do this for all his soldiers, but seeing the effect that the removal of nanomachines had on them, he came up with a different plan. Now, he intends to hijack the SOP system from the control of the Patriots, and wield that power himself. In other words, the thoughts and emotions that were under the control of the Patriots would now come under the control of Liquid. Worse yet, that control might extend to every person across the world who has injected themselves with nanomachines. Naomi begins to despair that there might not be anything they can do to stop Liquid's insurrection, that they will forever be chained to a fate beyond their control. That despair is deepened by the fact that Naomi's creation of the first generation nanomachines helped birth the war economy. Upon hearing this, Snake reminds her that she once told him that he must never become a prisoner of fate. Even if the odds are against them in every way, they still have to try. Right when Snake asks her where Liquid is, they suffer an ambush. Naomi is kidnapped by Liquid soldiers, leaving Snake to fight them off. After a long battle, Snake tracks Naomi to a nearby helipad. He manages to rescue her, but not without having to fight off several unmanned bipedal tanks, 
known as geckos. After reaching a nearby town, they initially conclude that they are no longer being chased. Snake and Naomi rush to the city center, where Otacon waits for them in a helicopter. Before they can get to Otacon, they are ambushed once again by geckos. When all hope seems lost, Snake spots a mysterious figure standing on the rooftops nearby. This figure then proceeds to eliminate all these tanks using only a blade and his enhanced athletics. Once these tanks are taken out, the mysterious figure reveals himself. It is Raiden, the protagonist of Metal Gear Solid 2. Raiden not only looks vastly different, but acts vastly different compared to the naive and sometimes neurotic Raiden that we saw last time. He is now a cybernetically enhanced super soldier. In the few moments that he speaks, we hear him utter world-weary philosophy, how he doesn't fear death and only finds meaning on the battlefield. Given this dramatic transformation, we the audience cannot help but feel curious as to what happened to him in the past five years. Though Raiden tried to live a normal life with his girlfriend Rose following the Big Shell incident, his personal issues still plagued him. The trauma he endured as a child soldier still haunted him. His unintentional involvement in helping the Patriots enslave the world during the Big Shell incident left him with enormous guilt. The final straw came when Rose suffered a miscarriage. With his heart broken and the battlefield calling to him, Raiden called off his engagement to Rose and returned to war. Soon after this, Rose got married to Roy Campbell, the man that Raiden thought he was communicating with in Metal Gear Solid 2, but who was revealed to be an AI. For Rose to marry the man whose visage was the same as the one who manipulated and mocked Raiden in Metal Gear Solid 2, to most people, it would seem like the universe collaborated in order to inflict the greatest insult possible on Raiden. Left completely and utterly broken, Raiden figured he could never come to terms with the pain he has endured. He would forever be a slave to his fate, to the forces that have controlled his life up until this point. The only place he found meaning, a life that could shield him from pure, unadulterated despair, was on the battlefield. This is where he has remained for the past few years. Though he did help Snake and Naomi escape onto the helicopter, he had to fight off one final foe, Vamp, one of the main villains from Metal Gear Solid 2, who is now one of Liquid's henchmen and is somehow still alive. Vamp looks to settle a five year long score with Raiden, seeing that Raiden managed to quote unquote kill him three times in Metal Gear Solid 2. They engage in a lengthy battle of blades, both managing to inflict serious damage on the other. After a few minutes, Raiden figures that Vamp is just too strong to beat through a conventional battle. And so, Raiden takes a drastic measure in order to try and kill Vamp. In a move that symbolizes Raiden's inner darkness, his disregard for his own life, Raiden stabs himself through the stomach in order to land a blow on Vamp, who is attacking him from behind. Thanks to Raiden's synthetic enhancements, he remains standing after this act of self-harm, and Vamp falls over, supposedly dead. Unfortunately, Raiden seemed to forget what happened in Metal Gear Solid 2, where he quote-unquote killed Vamp three times. Each time, Vamp miraculously returned from the dead thanks to, you guessed it, nanomachines. You would think that Raiden, with his remaining strength, would walk over to Vamp and cut off his head. But, for the sake of ensuring another awesome sword battle later on, Raiden decides to retreat to Otacon's helicopter. Vamp, of course, returns to life. Having lost a lot of blood, Raiden collapses. He is about to pass out when he looks to Snake and says the following. Go meet Big Mama. Upon returning to the Nomad, Naomi reveals Liquid's new intentions. In order for Liquid to access the SOP system, he needs to input a password. The password is the genetic code of Snake and Liquid's father, Big Boss. Much to their shock, Snake and Otacon are told by Naomi that Big Boss is alive, albeit in a vegetative state. He is kept in this state so that the genetic code isn't lost. 
If somebody needed to turn off or interact with the SOP network, the code is there to do so. The new mission is to find where Big Boss's body is and deliver it to safety before Liquid can retrieve it. Based on this information given by Raiden, the other three discover that Big Boss's body is being held by an enigmatic figure named Big Mama in Europe, specifically in England. After sending Raiden off to a doctor for dialysis, Snake sneaks through the streets of London during a city-wide curfew. He eventually arrives at Big Mama's location and learns that she is still in possession of Big Boss's body. However, this is not the only piece of information that Snake learns about. Over the course of 20 minutes, Big Mama makes several shocking revelations to Snake about the origin of the Patriots and what led to the conflict they are currently embroiled in. What was probably most shocking to Snake, though, was Big Mama's quick and seemingly indifferent revelation that she is Snake's mother. The revelations I'm about to list serve as the best example of not only this game's theme of sense, but all the previous themes as well. Big Mama was one of the founding members of the original Patriots, alongside several characters from Metal Gear Solid 3. These characters were Big Boss, Zero, Paramedic, Sigand, and Revolver Ocelot. Big Mama, during this game, was known as Eva. The original Patriot organization was established in the 1970s, several years after the events of the third game. It was established as a response to the death of a person that they idolized. This character was the boss, a woman who at the time was seen as the greatest soldier that ever lived. She was revered by armies across the world for her skills and exploits and for training the soldier that would eventually surpass her as the world's greatest soldier, that being Big Boss. During the events of Metal Gear Solid 3, she was used as a sacrificial lamb in order to maintain peace between the East and the West during the Cold War. Not only that, her reputation was tarnished. She was branded a traitor to the United States when she falsely, covertly, defected to the Soviets. The corruption and immorality surrounding her death, the victory of crooked politicians and lies over the efforts of a magnificent individual, sickened the original patriots. They figured that people like her, with all her intelligence, wisdom, and charisma, should help lead the world. So the patriots were formed so that they may interpret the boss's will and help build the world they thought she would have wanted. But within this organization, there were two interpretations about what the boss will truly was. On the one hand, Big Boss thought that she wanted a world where soldiers would not be used as expendable pawns by their government. In contrast, Zero thought the boss wanted the world to be unified under one single vision, one will, much like a religion. With the absence of the boss, Zero hoped to use Big Boss in her place as that unifying figure. Big Boss wasn't fond of this interpretation, because he did not like the idea of being used as Zero's puppet. As the years passed by, tensions between Zero and Big Boss grew over their differences in vision. Afraid of ultimately losing Big Boss as the unifying figure, Zero developed his own insurance policy, a project known as Les Enfants Terribles. This is the project that gave birth to Big Boss's clones, Solid Snake, Liquid Snake, and Solidus Snake. If Big Boss would not be that unifying figure, maybe one of his children could. Eva, of course, was the one who volunteered to be the surrogate mother in this experiment. When Big Boss discovered the existence of the Les Enfants Terribles project, the Patriots organization immediately split. Eva and Ocelot went off to follow Big Boss, and Paramedic and Sigint went off to follow Zero. While Big Boss spent the following decades trying to create Outer Heaven, Zero continued to pursue his vision of a unified world. This ultimately led to the creation of the Patriot AIs, formless masters that would control the direction of the world henceforth, supposedly in accordance with the boss's will. At some point, unfortunately, the AIs developed a will and a vision of their own, one that went against Zero's wishes. 
Simply put, it's hard to argue that the boss's will was a world perpetually engulfed in war, where people's thoughts were controlled through censorship of the internet, and eventually through nanomachines controlling their senses. One could argue that the intentions of Zero and Big Boss were noble, however, the resentment fueling their intentions, brought on by the death of the boss at the hands of the US and Soviet governments, caused them to lose their way. It seems that the Patriot AIs were proven right when they said that a single person has the potential to ruin the world. In this case, it was two of them. Now. It is up to a select few individuals to take on both the Patriots and Liquid and stop them from leaving the world in permanent chaos. Snake and Eva are soon ambushed by Liquid's army. They quickly retreat from their location along with Big Boss's body, leading to an extensive chase through the streets of London. Though Snake manages to defeat several of the soldiers and their leader, Eva unfortunately ends up impaled by a piece of debris after their bike falls over from a missile strike. Because she suffered an injury almost identical to this during the events of MGS3, Eva is able to endure the pain brought on by this injury and walk with Snake to the Thames River. She reveals that none of the vans that accompanied them during their escape contained the body of Big Boss. Instead, it was secretly moved to a boat, one they were currently walking toward. Ultimately, however, the breath of relief this information conferred would be in vain. Upon arriving at the river, they encounter Liquid. He was able to find out the true location of Big Boss and obtain his genetic code. Not only that, Liquid informs Snake and Eva that he rebuilt the GW Patriot AI that Snake and Raiden destroyed in Metal Gear Solid 2. With Big Boss's code, Liquid gains access to GW and soon will gain access to the remaining Patriot AIs. With no more use for his father, he burns the body, leaving Eva in a state of grief and despair. To rub salt in the wound, Naomi appears amongst them, revealing that she has defected to Liquid's side of the conflict. Before any sense can be made of this turn of events, Meryl and her army quickly arrive on the scene to take out Liquid's soldiers. Right when Meryl orders everyone to fire on Liquid, they discover that they are unable to use their weapons. Thanks to Big Boss's code, Liquid now has full access to the Sons of the Patriot system. He now has full control over every soldier injected with SOP nanomachines. As a result, he leaves Snake, Eva, Meryl, and her soldiers defenseless, and has his soldiers open fire. During this massacre, several soldiers die, including members of Meryl's Rat Patrol team and, worst of all, Eva. At this point in the game, the audience senses a pattern. Despite the best efforts of the protagonists, Liquid's grip on power is just too strong. No matter what they do, they continue to fail. All the other characters begin to despair. It seems as if all hope is lost. The genes, memes, scenes, and senses of the world would soon fall under one man's control, fulfilling both Zero and Big Boss's dreams at once. While characters like Otacon and Raiden struggle to pull themselves together, Snake reminds them that Liquid still doesn't have full control. He only controls the world's military. He has yet to control everything else that is still subject to the Patriots' influence. Things like governments, economies, and information. In other words, Liquid's mission has yet to be complete. There was still a chance that he could be stopped. They began to ask themselves what was left that stood in Liquid's way. Based on information communicated to Snake from Eva, they remembered that there was still a piece of technology maintaining the Patriots' control. It was a satellite orbiting the Earth, a satellite named JD. This satellite unified the other Patriot AIs into a single network of control, while preventing any outside influences from committing a digital coup d'etat. If Liquid could take out this satellite, he could use GW as a conduit to bring all the other AIs under his control. Unfortunately for Liquid, while he now controlled the world's military power, the use of nuclear weapons was still outside of his control. 
Use of nuclear weapons was governed by the JD satellite. Just like Merrill's soldiers couldn't pull their triggers, Liquid couldn't launch any surface-to-space missiles. So he had to find a missile that fell outside JD's scope of control, along with a piece of technology to launch it. There was only one such example of this type of weaponry, and it rested in a place that Snake never thought he would return. Shadow Moses Island. The setting of the first game. Liquid was going to use the railgun on Metal Gear Rex's right arm to launch that missile at JD. Though stopping Liquid from acquiring the railgun was a long shot, they still had to try. Despite this one faint glimmer of hope, they soon found out that they were too late. Upon arriving at Rex's corpse, they discovered that Liquid already came and removed the railgun. Before Snake can think about what, if anything, he can do next, Naomi and Vamp reappear. Vamp attempts to kill Snake, but Snake briefly gets the upper hand by injecting Vamp with nanomachines that suppress his regenerative abilities. Following this, Raiden reappears and engages Vamp in a second sword battle. Though Raiden once again suffers many wounds, he gains the upper hand and, for the fifth time, kills Vamp. But this time, permanently. While watching Vamp die, Naomi appears to be overcome with guilt by the destruction her nanomachine technology has wrought on the world. Out of despair, she injects nanomachine suppressants into her system, allowing pre-existing cancer cells to spread through her body and kill her. Snake and Otacon escape the underground base by using a reactivated Rex, but upon reaching the docks, a Metal Gear Ray unit appears from out of the water, piloted by Liquid. Both Rex and Ray engage in an epic battle that ends in a stalemate. Though Liquid and Snake remain alive, Snake's arm and leg were severely injured in the exchange, while Liquid was left relatively unharmed. Liquid runs away from Snake towards the end of the docks, while Liquid's warship emerges from beneath the water, a warship aptly titled Outer Haven. Before Snake can land a kill shot on Liquid, he escapes onto the ship, leaving Snake to succumb to his injuries. As Snake kneels on the cold, rocky ground, Liquid turns his ship around and attempts to run him over with the ship's bow. Before he can, Raiden sprints towards the ship and stops it with his cybernetic body. He pleads for Snake to get up and run, but Snake is unable to do so. Raiden strains and screams knowing that he and Snake are about to die. With his last breath, he screams for the only person he ever loved. No! Thanks to the few extra seconds gifted to Snake by Raiden's sacrifice, a nearby battleship fires on Outer Haven, forcing Liquid to retreat. On four separate occasions, our heroes attempted to stop Liquid and failed. Throughout their numerous attempts, they have lost several friends and loved ones. There was a glimmer of hope in the last chapter, but now, everything seems lost. Though Snake and his allies would attempt to infiltrate Outer Haven in one final push, they knew such an attempt would be suicide, which is why Snake volunteered to participate. With his accelerated aging, Snake knew he was close to death, and that the strength of his will was all that kept him alive. Given all of his life's efforts up until this point, he refused to spend his remaining days knowing he lost to his brother, knowing that evil had triumphed, knowing that he could have done something, even if the odds were definitively against him. Despite the anguish this final mission would have on Snake's body and mind, he knew he had to be the one to take down Liquid. Only then could he rest in peace. After Outer Haven resurfaced, Snake, Meryl, and her Rat Patrol partner Johnny were catapulted onto Liquid's HQ. The mission was to infiltrate the ship's core where the new GW was housed. Once there, they would upload a worm cluster into the GW AI. This would release Ocelot's grip on the SOP system and prevent him from firing a nuke at the JD satellite. But as I said before, the obstacles that stood before them presented an impossible challenge. Though they were miraculously able to fight through all of Liquid's soldiers, giving Snake a clear shot to the GW mainframe, he still had one final challenge to overcome. A tunnel filled with energy weapons that emitted microwaves. 
one giant oven. If Snake spent too much time in this tunnel, his body would eventually evaporate. Due to Snake's weakened condition, he is unable to run through this tunnel. He can only walk. No other scene in the entire Metal Gear saga demonstrates the strength of Snake's senses in such a powerful way. Every possible force is pulling down on Snake's body, tempting him to lay down and die. Snake almost reaches this point, and yet, even though he falls to his knees, he crawls forward. Even though he falls on the floor, he pulls himself forward by his hands. The audience is left to ponder how any man could discover the strength, let alone the desire to carry on at this point. Up until recently in my life, I wondered the same thing. Out of all the fantastical things that have happened throughout the series up until this point, this was, oddly enough, one of the more unbelievable. But now, whenever I watch this scene, I am reminded of the Viktor Frankl quote that I read towards the beginning of this video. Everything can be taken from a man, except for one thing, the ability to choose. Of all the times Snake fell victim to the whims of fate, he still maintained this last form of freedom. He was not going to let Liquid take that away from him. Within that freedom, he, like so many other heroes in reality or fiction, found the supernatural strength to pull himself forward. He escaped the microwave tunnel, reached GW, and uploaded the worm cluster. Upon doing this, something unexpected happened. Though the worm cluster was intended to merely destroy GW, the SOP, and prevent the nuclear strike, it appeared to do much more than that. The Worm Cluster used GW as a conduit to hack into all the other Patriot AIs, including JD, effectively annihilating the entire Patriot network. At first, it might have seemed like this was just another way for Liquid to obtain victory. After all, he wanted freedom from the Patriot's control, and this Worm Cluster seemed to provide just that. Not only that, the removal of the system that organized the world's economies, governments, transportation, medicine, it was now completely erased. However, we learn later that while this Worm Cluster was built to annihilate the Patriot AIs and their control, it would not destroy the system itself. The systems that were constructed by the Patriots remained, but they can now be operated by humans instead of AIs. In other words, the best possible outcome was achieved, even though victory seemed all but impossible. But before our heroes could truly celebrate, there was one last thing that had to be done. Liquid was still alive. Before Snake could be rescued and have his wounds looked after, Liquid walks up to him. Both of them realized that their war was almost over. There were no other goals left for them to achieve in the little life they both had left, save for one. They had a decade-long score to settle, and so they engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat. They battle to the death, punching and kicking to see whose body would give in first. The battle lasts several minutes, culminating in Snake and Liquid exchanging singular blows. But ultimately, given the strength of Snake's will, he bests his opponent. As Liquid slowly died, his personality faded, which allowed Ocelot's personality to take hold for a brief moment. With his last few breaths, Ocelot demonstrated good sportsmanship and congratulated Snake on his victory. You're pretty good. You're pretty good. Pretty good. Before I detail the game's ending, I want to acknowledge something important. The Metal Gear Solid saga is filled with so many different interconnected story threads. Leading up to this retrospective, I feel like I did a pretty good job focusing solely on the story threads that exemplify Hideo Kojima's one-word themes. However, with Metal Gear Solid 4, there were so many different things happening, so much exposition. If I included every part of this game's story that exemplified the sense theme, the video would be two hours long. At that point, why wouldn't you just turn off the retrospective and go play the game for yourself? In order to keep a brisk pace and keep the focus on the sense theme, I omitted a couple of important story details. With that said, I want to quickly mention what those elements are before I move on to the game's epilogue. 
The main bosses in the game, the Beauty and the Beast Corps, all have stories that greatly exemplify the sense theme, in that they all succumb to their senses and go insane. If I were to detail their stories, that would have added 30 minutes to this video, and would have taken focus away from our protagonists who I felt were more important. I didn't talk much about Sunny either, even though she does play a key role in saving the world with the Patriot Worm Cluster. I felt that explaining the little ways she played a key role in the story would have, once again, interrupted the flow of the video. Plus, a lot of us still have a hard time accepting that a 7 year old could be capable of such genius that she could help Naomi create such a program. To focus on that would have taken away from the purpose of this retrospective series, which is to look back in reverence. Also, Raiden didn't die when he got hit by the ship. He miraculously survived and helped Snake during his infiltration into Outer Heaven. Once again, another example of the audience having to suspend their disbelief. I mean, sure, the Metal Gear Solid saga features people who read minds, who live beyond the dead and can come back to life through nano-augmentation. But even with that, there is a certain degree of logic at play. In regards to characters like Raiden and Sunny, their experiences sometimes border on the miraculous. Liquid Ocelot's right arm, which we thought was Liquid Snake's right arm, was replaced with a prosthetic sometime between Metal Gear Solid 2 and 4. Though in MGS2, Liquid's personality surfaced within Ocelot due to the remnants of his nanomachines that remained in the arm, Liquid's personality in this game is a ruse brought about via a combination of hypnotic suggestion and nanomachines. The purpose of this was to confuse the Patriots long enough in order to destroy them. One last small thing that I'd like to mention was that earlier on in the game, Snake was injected with another version of Fox Die by a character named Drebin. This version, like the version we saw in the first game, would target the nanomachines of certain individuals and bring about their deaths. I'll explain why this is important in a couple of minutes. There are other story threads and characters that I omitted from this retrospective, but the few I just mentioned were the primary ones I wanted to acknowledge. With that out of the way, let us conclude our discussion of Sense. Meryl receives her happy ending. She not only reconciles with her true father, but she also finds a positive male influence in her life, one that she decides to marry. She achieves that balance of femininity and masculinity she always unconsciously craved, symbolized by her holding her gun while wearing a wedding dress. Her strength of character allowed her to move beyond her difficult past. Now, her future looks exceedingly bright. Raiden reunites with the love of his life. Not only that, he discovers that he has a son. Apparently, he was told that Rose had a miscarriage in order to protect the son from the Patriots. A dreadful sacrifice, but one that resulted in a most wondrous surprise. Now that the war is over and Raiden has made a full recovery, he has the chance to live a normal life as a father and a husband. As for Snake, our last moments with him take place exclusively in a graveyard, the place where his father, Big Boss, was buried. In one of his last acts before his inevitable death, he decides to visit the grave. It obviously came as an enormous shock to him that, during this visit, a very much alive Big Boss showed up behind him. Big Boss begins to not only explain how it's possible that he is still alive, but he also summarizes the events of the entire Metal Gear saga. First of all, the body that Liquid burnt in London wasn't actually Big Boss's body. It was actually the body of Solidus Snake, the main antagonist of Metal Gear Solid 2. He was a perfect clone of Big Boss, which was why Liquid was still able to gain access to the SOP system. This was a perfect ruse hatched by Naomi and Eva to protect the real Big Boss, who was kept alive in a coma thanks to nanomachines. He was then brought to life using spare parts from Liquid and Solidus. Unfortunately, Big Boss and Snake don't have much time left together. The strain of fox dye that Drebin injected Snake with at the beginning of the game was coded by the Patriots. One of the targets of that fox dye was Big Boss. With his last moments alive, Big Boss reminisces on his mentor, the Boss, and how he and his former partner, Zero, failed to carry out her will. 
the attempts they did make brought the world to the brink of destruction. Though this is the case, it is hard to feel pure hatred for Big Boss. After all, what happened to his mentor was unjust. The governments of the world that orchestrated her demise and tarnished her legacy would feel almost any person to seek justice. That was what he and Zero tried to do. Unfortunately, their senses were so blinded by the pain they felt that they were unable to see when their actions clearly went against the boss's will. The destruction that both Big Boss and Zero wrought came so close to destroying the world, but thanks to his son and his enormous sense of morality and persistence, the world had a second chance. In that vein, Snake inadvertently provided a response to the Patriots' claim that a single individual had the potential to ruin the world. What is also true is that a single individual had the potential to save it. And thanks to Snake's efforts, he would surpass his father and become the icon that he never was. The moral symbol that would lead the future generations into a bright, prosperous future. But before this could happen, all remnants of the past order would need to pass on. It was thanks to the warm cluster that Snake and Otacon injected into GW that Big Boss was able to discover Zero's location. He, too, was still alive, albeit in a vegetative state. After recounting their history to Snake, Big Boss pulls the plug on Zero's life support, and almost immediately after, Big Boss begins to succumb to the effects of Fox Die. Snake carries Big Boss over to the grave of his former mentor, so he could say goodbye one last time. As her gravestone fell within his vision, he experienced a revelation. He finally understood what the boss's true will was. She never wanted the world to change. She wanted it to remain the way it is. And as that revelation dawned on him, he used his remaining strength to stand at attention and raise his right hand in a salute. He then collapses before Snake, and as he crosses over to the other side, he speaks as if he were reunited with his former mentor. This is good, isn't it? again.